I have studied Japanese every day for the last two years, and I'm gonna be honest, I think I'm starting to regret it. I moved to Japan right when I started studying, and oh my god, this language sucks to learn. As of right now, I'm about N2 level, which for those who don't know, is the ability to understand Japanese used in everyday situations and in a variety of circumstances to a slight degree. I'm able to hang out with friends with Japanese, I can understand like slice of life anime, and I could probably go on a date with Japanese people, but I don't really know what that's like, I've never done it before. So you're probably thinking, what's so bad about studying Japanese? Japanese every day. I mean, I heard language learning is supposed to be fun. I mean, it must be great seeing the world around you unfold and no, no, it's not. It's not worth it. I'll explain more in detail, but I basically want to make this video for those who are interested in learning this language. And God bless your soul if that's for you, but you're in for a real treat. <laughs> so basically, there's five levels of difficulty from learning a language from English. So category one is like Spanish and French take about maybe like half a year to understand fully. And category two is just German. Category three is Indonesian, Malaysian, and Swahili. And category four is uh, all of those languages. There's a lot in category four. So category one to four are each divided by about six weeks of language learning time. You know, category one is like 24, category two is 32. And you know, that's cute and all, you know, you can get like proficiency in all these languages in like half a year to a year. It's pretty good, right? So what about Japanese? Well, Japanese is in category five, which, you know, must be like six weeks away from category four. Right? So if category four is 44, then it should only take about 50 weeks to learn Japanese, right? No, no, it's not 50 weeks. It's 88 weeks, 88 weeks. 88 weeks, that's about one year and eight months just to be considered generally proficient in Japanese. So Japanese is in category five with Chinese, Arabic, and Korean. And people love to argue which of these four languages are the hardest. So let's say you've dabbled in learning Japanese. You know, you made a little dinkle account, you got gold for about four levels. So you know, you know about hiragana, katakana, you have a grasp on the meaning of about 50 kanji. You're doing pretty good. And this is the point where I see most people quit because once they've gotten past Kana, this is when they start to look into the abyss and the abyss looks back with cold, dark, and meaningless eyes. You start to realize maybe you don't want to learn this language. And you know you're swarmed, you're mentally overwhelmed by the idea of learning 2,200 kanji. And you know, all of these kanji, they have multiple readings and all of a sudden you had to learn over 10,000 words. Like you have no idea what you signed up for. In the Japanese learning community, you'll notice that the majority of people quit here because they just realize they're not really cut out for this. You know, maybe they're just like too mentally healthy to start learning Japanese to fluency. Maybe they have like a life or something. So before I go any further, I'm gonna try to explain the Japanese learning iceberg for you guys. I think looking at this iceberg can be a pretty helpful tool. And if you guys are thinking about learning Japanese, it might be good to keep this stuff in mind, you know? So at the tip of this iceberg, you have, you know, konnichiwa, arigato, sayonara, Yamete kudasai senpai. For some reason you know that. I know you don't, don't pretend you don't. You know what that means. You know, this is where about maybe 50% of you guys watching are. And I gotta be honest, it's a pretty lovely place to be. A little bit further down in the iceberg and you start to learn, you know, hiragana and katakana. This is where learning Japanese is the most fun, but you know, it's still above water level. I mean, once you learn katakana, you basically know like 30% of this language because they like to use their little funny version of English to describe most things. And just to show you how convenient and easy katakana is, let me show you some uh, Japanese words compared to their English meanings. Kohi, coffee, computer, computer, hamburger, hamburger. Okay, good, good, you're doing pretty good. What about konsento, cream, what? No. Consentful means power outlet and kurimu means complaint. What's wrong with you, you dirty-minded freak? What, what problems do you have? Why would you think that it means that? So yeah, at this point, you'll begin to get the idea that nothing in Japanese is rational. But you know what? Either way, you can tell you because you're already a weekend and you already know so much. You know, at this rate, you'll be watching Rent a Girlfriend with Japanese subtitles. You know, you won't need to use any English. You'll 100% understand it. Pay full attention to your favorite waifu. You don't need any subtitles to distract you from your favorite waifu and rent a girlfriend. I mean, like, let's be honest, if you're not planning on living in Japan, like, what reason do you have to learn Japanese anyway? So yeah, you've already learned about two of the three big alphabets, you know, you're feeling like you're making some pretty good progress. Good for you, man. You know, you're finally getting some exposure in a different language. You're learning words like watashi, anata, inu, chinchin, and you're understanding it in a different alphabet. Good for you. 
And now it's getting more fun by the day. You know, you decide to take the next big step. So now you're learning some grammar. You know, you start taking some big steps. You learn like pa, no, ni, de, des, and other various grammar points. You're learning some particles. You know, they're a little bit confusing, but after a while, you start to get the hang of it. And sooner or later, you get to understand sentences and sentence object verb rather than the English version of sentence verb object. And you know what? You're making some big progress. You know, just ask anybody how to use ha versus ga. And I promise, they'll be able to explain it in a short and concise way. So once you've gone past particles, you've officially entered the surface of the water of this iceberg. You know basic grammar structure, maybe you know about 100 words. You know what? You're making some pretty fast progress. You know what? Maybe if I say, maybe you'll even understand me. So now that you got kana down, the next big step for you is kanji. But you hear everybody griping about it, but like, what's the big deal? I mean, for example, just look at the kanji for one. Iti. No, 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 that, not that one, not that one, this one, iti. And look at the kanji for two, for two, ni. No, 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 not, not that one. They're very easy and they make sense. I'm already beginning to understand words like Tokyo. It's awesome. But you know, then there's a little plot twist. What if I told you that the to in Tokyo isn't actually pronounced to on its own? Let me explain. I mean, just look at this character. Isn't it obvious? I mean, it's, if you can read it, obviously it says higashi. And what do you think that means? Are you stupid? It means east, obviously. Okay, so let's take the same kanji and let's add another stroke to it. What do you think that means? North, south, west? No, you imbecile. You'll never know Japanese. It means car and it's pronounced kudama. Are you stupid? But it's not only read as kudama because whenever you combine this kanji with another kanji, it's actually pronounced as sha, obviously. So at this point in your language learning journey, you're beginning to understand the difference between kunyomi and onyomi. Kunyomi is basically just how a kanji on its own forms like its own word. Like this, for example. Oh wait, that doesn't exist. Uh, uh, but onyomi is very simple. It's the sound that the kanji makes when it's combined with another word. So this one would be like, let's see, we have uh, se, na, jo, nari, naru, or se. But don't use the wrong one in the wrong context or else you'll sound really stupid. And of course there's easier examples like this one. On its own it just means ne. It means like, you know, price, but what does it mean when it's combined? When you put it next to other words, it's suddenly pronounced chi, but you know, it still means price. I mean, that's easy enough, right? So let's put, you know, the word for example. So let's take chi with another character. Let's say su, which means numeric, for example. So su chi. What do you think that means? That's right, numeric value. You're really good at this. So let's take another. Let's take the value chi and let's take management. So you have Chikan, chikan. What does that mean? What do you think it means? Budget, financial management? No, no it doesn't. Do you know what it means when you say chikan? That means molester. Don't say that to the wrong person. What is wrong with you? So yeah, if you haven't figured it out by now, kanji makes absolutely no sense no matter how you put it. Don't even bother trying to learn all like the meanings or readings. It's gonna take you like five years to get that down. Just learn like words as they are. Otherwise you're just wasting time. So during my first year of learning Japanese, I spent the entire year just kind of like learning kanji, but I ended up learning about 2000 kanji and maybe like 3000 or 4000 words. It ended up working pretty well. So imagine this, you know about 2200 kanji, you know 4000 words, you're on top of the world and you know what? This is a point where you can say, okay, I can finally start learning Japanese now. So yeah, learning kanji is its own thing that already takes up like half of this iceberg. I mean, even if you learn all 2200 recommended kanji, there's still like 75,000 total. That's a lot. Let me tell you, after learning like 2200 kanji, there's no worse feeling in the world than coming across kanji that you have no idea what they mean. It's the worst feeling in the world, I swear to God. Okay, so let's say you end up where I am. You know, you learn 2200 kanji. What's next? Oh yeah, there's another rabbit hole to go down and it's called grammar. Grammar, grammar, grammar. Boom pull, unko, whatever you want to call it. It's all the same. Do you remember those particles I mentioned earlier? Like ha, ga, ne, ni, you know, all that? Yeah, so if you can get the hang of that, congratulations. You're about 1% through 
all of Japanese grammar. Oh yeah, by the way, those particles, there's about 180 of them total. So if you learn the basics, don't think you've gotten the hang of it yet because you haven't. Anyway, speaking of grammar, let's talk about verb conjugation. Okay, so let's take a verb, for example. Let's take uh, the verb for to eat, taberu. So taberu on its own means to eat. But if you want to say ate, if you want to say I ate something, that would mean tabeta. If you want to say I am eating, that's tabeteru, you know. You just replace like the lu, the ta, it's pretty simple, you know? Okay, so let's push the envelope, you know, you have tabeteru, tabeta, tabeteru. Let's say forced to eat. That would mean uh, tabesaseru, you know, nothing too crazy. But, I mean, shouldn't you be a bit more respectful? I mean, I'm the teacher. Let's use a more respectful tense. So maybe something like, o tabere narasete masuta. Well, that's a bit too polite. Let's just go with, well, that's a bit too polite. Let's just go with, uh, tabesasete masuta. And you know what? If none of that made any sense to you, don't worry. It made no sense to me either. But just know, that's only the conjugations for tabere. There's a totally different set of rules for conjugation when it comes to verbs like wadao, which means to laugh. If you want to say laughter, for example, that would just mean wadai. But that also means some other happy words like smile, sex toys, sex aids, you know, what I, that's a very happy and good word. You should learn it, but don't use it in the wrong context. Otherwise you'll sound really weird. So yeah, that's just the very like half of the iceberg. I could go on for days, but basically just know that even after studying for two to three hours every day for the last two years, I still am not satisfied with how much I know. I still feel like I know absolutely nothing about this language. And that's a horrible feeling. So yeah, if you've ever studied Japanese as much as I have, you'll understand that you're always gonna feel like you're horrible and it's a terrible feeling, you'll never feel satisfied. And even after like so long, I feel like I'm still really bad at this language. And a part of this dissatisfaction is the fact that the primary way for measurement of language dexterity, the JLPT, is a really bad system. So first of all, one is the best and five is the worst, which goes like completely contrary to every other language measurement. But even if you do study for one of these tests, you'll realize that even if you get to N1, which is the best, you'll only end up about where 30% of native speakers are. Not only will you be at only 30% of where you should be, but in the process, you'll also end up starting to dig yourself a grave for your future learning of Japanese. For example, some of the more common words you will not really even know. Like, you're gonna learn how to say philosophy and magic trick, which are N3 words, before you learn how to say anger, which is an N1 word, so. It's gonna take you like another six months before you even learn like the basics. It's completely backwards. So you may be wondering, why am I even making this video? Is this just like some rant about learning Japanese two years in the making? Am I trying to like discourage you from learning Japanese so you can do something else instead? Well, discourage isn't the way I'd put it. I prefer the word save. Let me explain. Okay, so here's a list that I found. Even though I said the JLPT is like a flawed measurement system and all of that, this list will illustrate what you can do in the amount of time that it takes to pass the JLPT level instead of learning Japanese. So instead of getting to N5, so let's say you're starting out with zero knowledge and you want to pass N5. It'll take about 462 hours of study time. You can either choose to learn Spanish to a very advanced level or you can just study Japanese to like a mediocre level. So once you get past N5, you'll find yourself at N4. You're gonna need another 300 hours of study time to get from N5 to N4, and that's gonna place you around 787 hours of total study time. You can get a train conductor license in Japan, and if you spent this time on other languages instead of Japanese, you could get to Spanish, French, and Italian to complete fluency, or you can choose to be subpar Japanese. So to get from N4 to N3, it's gonna take you about another 550 hours of studying, totaling at 1,325 hours. At this point, you could learn, let's see, Spanish, French, Italian, German, and Portuguese. So what about N3 to N2? Well, let me ask you a question. You have four pills that you can take. So one pill gives you fluency in, let's see, Spanish, French, Italian, German, Portuguese, Dutch, Afrikaans, and maybe even Danish. You can take another pill and become a fully trained and capable pilot in that amount of time. Or you can take another pill and become a USA certified public accountant. You would make a lot of money if you did that. Or you can take a pill that allows you to understand the premise of a shonen anime without subtitles. Either way, taking this pill, you're gonna have to lose about 2,200 hours. So finally, there's N2 to N1. This is where I'm stuck personally. N2 requires about 2,200 hours of studying. Um, N1 requires a total of 4,000 hours of studying. 4,000 hours? You know, 4,000 hours of studying one language? You could spend 162 days on a cruise ship 
you could travel the entire world, experience multiple cultures, change your life, absolutely see everything in the world. You could go from one point in the world all the way back to that one point across the entire globe, or you can sit at your desk and be 30% as good at Japanese as a native speaker. It's your choice. Truth be told, I don't want to actually discourage you from learning the language. To be honest, I just want to save people's time. If after hearing this information, you don't have the will to learn Japanese anymore, you weren't really cut out to do it in the first place. I, I told you what you're getting into, and after receiving that information, you decided, okay, I don't want to learn this language. But let's say after I tell you all of this, after I tell you what all you can do in that amount of time, instead of learning Japanese, you still decide, no, I would rather learn this language with one third of the capacity as a native speaker than do any of that. In that case, I, you have my support. I'm gonna be honest, you have my entire support and I completely encourage you to learn this language. The hardest part isn't getting through the grammar or getting through the kanji. Honestly, after a while, it becomes easy. The hardest part is just waking up every day and being willing to just sacrifice two to three hours a day to just learning one language. The thing that personally drove me to learn Japanese is the fact that I live here. And to some extent, I feel like I owe the people that have treated me well is the effort of learning their language. My worst fear is that I go to some area in the middle of nowhere that doesn't speak English and I miss out on a lot of opportunities to get to know people despite the fact that I lived here for two years. The fact that I can't like communicate with somebody and get to know them like terrifies me. It's really something I can't describe and even after 2,200 hours, maybe even longer at this point, like I would say it's worth it. And honestly, another big part of it is I was so driven to learn Japanese for the sake of being able to make YouTube videos that the foreigners that didn't bother to learn Japanese couldn't make. Truth be told, I really wanted to start YouTube like two years ago and I tried, but I realized that there's a huge barricade for the content I wanna make just because I don't speak Japanese. So I decided I'm willing to like put two years of my life, throw them away just to like learn Japanese because I just really wanna make this channel work. I wanna give you guys the best content I can. And soon I'm gonna be finally able to make some content where I get to put my language skills to use and I'm really excited to make that content. And you know, sometimes I have to ask myself, like did I make the right decision to you know sacrifice two years of working on my dream and I put that aside to learn Japanese? And honestly, the answer is probably no because AI is gonna be able to do it for me in the next 10 years.